Uh, well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this evening's lecture. I'm uh, Nick Pierce. I'm um, the Professor of Public Policy and Director of the Institute for Policy Research at the University of Bath. Uh, and um, I'm delighted to welcome you this evening to uh, uh, a lecture in our series on uh, oceans that we've been running at the Institute by Professor Maria Fazzaro of the University of Exeter. Um, for those of you who've been um, uh, attending these lectures, watching these lectures online in uh, recent months, you'll know we've covered a whole range of issues relating to uh, uh, the, our oceans and oceanic spaces, um, principally climate change and oceanic warming and what that's doing to our oceans, uh, the impact of resource extraction, uh, fishing, coastal farming, uh, pollution and waste on our oceans uh, and what that entails, its impacts, and of course questions of socio and economic development, the impact on indigenous communities, the impact on uh, coastal communities, uh, particularly from climate uh, change, climate vulnerability. Uh, these are issues that we've, ex we've debated uh, extensively in this series. And we thought it would be very valuable and useful uh, to bring to bear on some of those questions an historical perspective, and in particular to try to learn from history uh, about some of the challenges we face uh, today. And that's why we're delighted to have Professor uh, Maria Fasaro with us this evening. Um, you know, we want to think about how history can help us understand geopolitical struggles that take place around maritime spaces, around uh, our oceans, to think about how law uh, has uh, governed uh, trade uh, and conflict um, in the seas, in maritime areas and maritime activities. And of course, we can see that very, very tangibly today when we think about, uh, for example, the conflict in Ukraine, uh, the Black Sea and access to the Black Sea uh, and maritime law and respect to the Black Sea. We also see it in the Eastern Mediterranean in conflict over uh, drilling rights and access to areas in the seabed in the Eastern Mediterranean. And perhaps, you know, of most global significance, of course, in uh, Southeast Asia, in East Asia, uh, when we talk about the um, struggles over uh, uh, trade, security, islands, um, uh, naval routes uh, in the South China Seas, in uh, places like the Malacca Straits and so on, where a great deal of the current geopolitical conflict between the US and China is being played out. So these are really big questions, and um, we, we do think that history can help us understand some of those. So we're delighted that Maria is with us this evening. She is Professor of Social and Economic History and Director of the Centre for Maritime Historical Studies at the University of Exeter. Her research interests lie in the social and economic, in social and economic history inter interpreted in its, in its broadest sense of early modern Europe, and her primary expertise is in the history of Italy, especially the Venetian Republic and the Mediterranean between the 15th and 18th centuries. Um, her research has focused on commercial networks and the role they played in the early phases of globalization on the economic, social and cultural analysis of late medieval and early modern empires and on the early modern development of legal institutions uh, supporting trade. And just to sort of complete the CV, she's also published on commercial litigation and the status of foreigners in civil courts in the early uh, medieval and early modern period, the trade between the Mediterranean and the north of Europe, it's a very important and interesting question, and the history of the Venetian dominions in Greece, and on the dialogue between different ways of conceptualizing historical historiographies between different nations, different national historiographies. Um, so it'll be great to hear, Maria, I'm going to hand over to her in just a second. Well, first of all, I would like to thank Nick Pierce for his invite to participate in this most topical series of talks about the ocean, our oceans. It's interesting, our and important. I was invited to provide a view, as Nick just said, on how oceanic histories can inform our current way of thinking about the oceans. And learning from history is always an aspiration more than a reality for us human beings. So fingers crossed that sooner we'll manage to actually learn and not just read about it and think, oh, but it's in the past, things are different now. <clears throat> and public policy is, is central to this series and, and reaching out to policymaker is never easy for us historians. However, I think this is a particularly stimulating time uh, in regard of history on maritime matters and the research which is happening because the contemporary 
activities and desperate search, if you will, for sustainable social and economic solution. Um, and really something to learn from how such things were handled in the past. And it can provide us with some interesting solutions, which frankly, myself only two or three years ago, I would never have thought possible. But at the end of my lectures, I hope that some of the elements will become clear to everyone that there is something practical to learn with uh, solutions that can both sustain economic development and at the same time provide a bit more equitable treatment for all parties at play. It is banal, but absolutely necessary to say that the considerations which will follow reflect my own personal take and view on these issues. Others are indeed possible, especially as maritime history over the last 10 years has gone out of its traditional niche place and joined mainstream historical research, becoming active as a sub-discipline in most of the debates which are active within history at large across the planet. The goal of this series is to examine many of the issues affecting oceans today. And I will focus specifically on four of these issues. How these new approaches to oceanic histories are helping us to deal with jurisdictional problems, issues regarding economic exploitation. I will touch briefly also on what is being done in terms of the analysis of pollution and climate change also for the past. And I will hopefully end with an optimistic note about the possibility of learning something in regard to sustainable economic solutions. These developments are incredibly active within academic history proper. You know, big books, lots of footnotes, and writing styles sometimes a tad obscure, but are also having an impact, although it is by nature a slower one, towards this very large market in trade books that is a unique and incredibly interesting characteristic of the Anglophone word, particularly the UK and the US. And here I think lays a true peculiarity of the Anglosphere, if you will, as a funny foreigner, insofar as non-professional historians, such as policymaker, the informed public, the professional who is interested in a topic, tend to read trade books, which are more lively. They normally are more loud in supporting one theory or the other. And frequently, they are far better written than our academic books. And the result is that they get less familiarity with the state of the art of the discipline because between academic proper production, the boring stuff, if you will, and the trade books, there's normally around 10 years delay. So some of the issues that are very active now in academic history will be in trade books in the future once they've been digested but are not quite there yet. One big hole will be today in my lecture, and it's maritime conservation, historical management of resources. I have had the pleasure of listening to many of the lecture, actually all of the lectures of this series, and this was a topic of extreme interest. However, it's in massive expansion within maritime history and maritime historical anthropology. And these are areas where really my expertise does not lay. Nick briefly described what I do. And as a specialist of the legal and economic frame of the early modern period, which basically means from the end of the 15th century to the French Revolution, it is within these parameters that I will talk today. If I had to give you three keywords, that bring together the things you see on the slide, I would say global, 
transnational, which is different, and networks. And in a sense, these are three red threads that go across all the literature and the discussions which are happening today. New approaches to oceanic histories, it's, it's a big word, also because even the nature of oceans is contested from the legal perspective. So I prefer to think in terms of seas. But from the geopolitical and economic perspectives, and they're rather separate and parallel, if you will, both of them experienced a shift away from a traditional classic narrative, which was centered mostly on the Atlantic experience in the early modern world. And Atlantic was shorthand for the West, the winners. Had I been asked to give this talk 10 years ago, there would have been an awful lot more Atlantic. Since then, there has been a veritable boom of studies concerned with the Indian Ocean and a fundamental reconsideration of the Mediterranean for the early modern period, which before was dismissed as a region in decline and therefore unworthy of attention. Contemporary political developments have played an important role in stimulating these new approaches and studies. The drive towards translational analysis of the Indian Ocean and economic and social activities which took place on those waters has been driven by two main elements. Its centrality for the processes underpinning proto-globalization, as most European players were very active in the Indian Ocean. In the Atlantic, paradoxically, there were less. And a focus on neglected evidence. In short, as historians tend to delve into archives, particularly for the pre-modern period. And what has happened is that we have moved as a group from a study of the archives and the documentary evidence which survived in the metropolises of the various European empires to those of the colonized. And changing archive changes perspective dramatically. There's also been an active shift from a more political and normative evidence-centered research to social and economic factors, which are fantastically well served by archives across the planet, indeed. And the result of this has been to bring to the surface the operational functioning of social and economic activities through a bottom-up approach, which also have the side effect positive one in my view, to avoid a Eurocentric view that just projected the hegemonic views of European powers active there. Scholarly production has investigated these issues for around 30 years across many different countries, many different languages, many different national historiographical traditions, and many different methodological approaches. So for most of us, professional historians, the, the recent, the actively today, cultural and political drive towards decolonizing the curriculum, which in the UK is particularly noisy, is in reality not a surprise. It's just a result of closing that time gap, which I mentioned before, between academic and trade books and popular books. The last to arrive normally are school books. Um, school books tend to have around 20 years of delay, a full generation between what scholars are actually done and what is told children. And it's actually fascinating for professional historians who have children going through the system to see how what they're studying now is something that was investigated 20 or 30 years ago. For the Mediterranean instead, as a rediscovered sea, it was frankly the global shock of September 11, which acted as a catalyst for new studies. There was an urgency, if you will, 
at trying to go to the bottom of so many of the mythologies about the long durée conflict, interaction between various types of Christianities, Islam and Judaism across the seas. Uh, in fact, the discovery of substantial Jewish entrepreneurship of maritime matter was a fantastic discovery because frankly, for a long time, it was thought that on the seas, the Jews were not active and indeed they were. But I mentioned the importance of the global element because the Mediterranean is absolutely central to global history, particularly the pre-modern Mediterranean. And the reality is that at the beginning of the global history phenomenon, there was a certain attitude in which global was far away. Allow me to be provocative. So far away, of course, is relative to Europe. So we're going back to a sort of funny shape of Eurocentrism. So global history is not something that happens far away. It's something that happens at home, wherever home is, because of phenomena that took place far away and close by. And the study of the Mediterranean is reclaiming its centrality in global history, not because of any triumphalist Eurocentrism, but exactly for the opposite reason, as its social structures and economic performances were the first victims of proto-globalization. The investigations of the solution employed to counteract the effect of proto-globalization can have some relevance also for contemporary policy, as Europe today is facing challenges in terms of economic development and maritime trade, which are not very dissimilar from those experienced, for example, by the republics of Venice and Genoa in the late Middle Ages and early modern period. Throughout these elements, there is one queen topic which has taken center stage and is that of sovereignty, mostly of how sovereignty was expanded, conceptualized, developed and put into practical action at sea. And this is something in which there are fundamental differences from how it took place on land. And the shift away from nation-centered narratives has also pushed towards a new attention to the way in which this actualization, if you will, of sovereignty interacted with the vexed issue of maritime conflict management, which as Nick was mentioning, is an area of burning political relevance. What we are discovering now is the importance of connection and entanglements between private parties and statal entities as the basis for both formal and informal diplomatic engagement at the basis of the development of international law, which is a phenomenon in continuous change. So, whilst we started from a very statalist perspective in which we saw one nation, one nation state expanding, then there was a shift towards self-regulating networks. Now we're finally appreciating that there's not one without the other. Lauren Bentham work has been absolutely pathbreaking in this regard and the search for sovereignty is the first book in this slide, has been amazing in really opening the eyes of an entire generation as to the fact that sea lanes were the avenues of practical expansion of jurisdiction. And this change of perspective stimulated new ways of analyzing the reality of pre-modern jurisdiction, creating an incredibly complex map far different from that which we thought we had 20 years ago. And this, as you can see from this few titles that I've chosen, is something that is happening across 
all oceans, with the possible ex exception of the Pacific, which still remains the most historically understudied, if nothing else, because of very little survival of evidence for the pre-modern period. What this new approach has showed us is a fundamental connection between claims of sovereignty and the practicalities of conflict resolution. For these discussions, the analysis of the early modern Mediterranean is again particularly relevant for contemporary debates on jurisdictions and their expansions. As the Mediterranean was an area thick with competing and overlapping jurisdictions, and none could be quite ignored, as it happened frequently in other oceans, or simply plainly militarily crushed, which is again what happened in several other bodies of water. The period from the last quarter of the 16th to the end of the 17th century, before nation states as we conceive them today, and before the implementation of properly nation-based commercial strategies, saw in the Mediterranean a far greater intermingling of nationalities and interest that would be the case for the subsequent centuries. It's a situation that had interesting resonances with the present situation of international maritime trade, which is experiencing profound changes, some of them brought about by technological development. In the 17th century, there were new construction techniques and new sailing techniques. Now, the easiest example I can give is that of containeriz containerization. And by the entrance of new shipping nations, into an established situation, which always causes problem in the reception of jurisdictions. Then it was the English and the Dutch. Today, it is the Chinese. Now, today we like to think of things as having moved beyond what us historian called a Westphalian state-centered form of politics that includes only states to a more varied landscape in which non-state actors play an important role. But the interaction of these two levels of governance, the state one and the non-state one, remains possibly the most fertile area of investigation. The 17th century, in a sense, is the opposite side of, side of the cycle. Now, today we have states that feel their areas of expansion and jurisdiction is being shrunk because of the growing importance of non-state actors. In the 17th century, states were instead expanding their own area of jurisdictions and their authorities. And so the interaction is in a sense mirroring what is happening now. However, these issues remained central to state and imperial concerns well beyond the early modern period. The last book on the slides that by Reni Samawani analyzes jurisdictional tensions between common law and admiralty law in the 19th and early 20th century. So it's, there's a very long influence, if you will, of these issues. Conflict resolution, of course, also means management of violence at sea, another area of growing contemporary concern for economic reasons, but also for social reason and political reasons. For a long time, <clears throat> for a very long time as historians, that is to say most of the 20th century literature truly followed and believed Max Weber's idea that the state has a monopoly of violence. But now we're finally really appreciating how much the line between formal and informal violence at sea, let's say state sanctioned privateers or plain pirates has always been a thin one then as now. All the studies that you see on this slide provide you with a good spread 
of what is currently being investigated. And three elements have them in common, regardless of the different geographical location or the different time period under investigation. First, violence at sea is connected to state formation and establishment. In other words, to those issues of how to expand jurisdiction at sea that I have just mentioned. The criminalization of violence at sea is linked to the development of then European and today contemporary economies. And the third element is that networks are emerging as an interpretative grid also in the way piracy is studied. It used to be a time when piracy was studied as a purely criminal phenomenon. Now it is studied as a social phenomenon that has to do with development and economic development. We're back to jurisdiction. The first big European war of books, if you will. <clears throat> so in itself, I didn't even try to discuss how the issues of whether the sea should be open or closed is developed today. And I thought that confronted with a monumental embarrassment of riches, one might as well go back to the origins. One side, <clears throat> you have Mare Liberum, and on the other side, you've got Mare Clausum. So an absolute classic element, which again, touches the fact that Grotius and Selden we're discussing of things that today are at the forefront of US and China diplomatic engagements. Mind you, probably not over the last six weeks, but over the last five or six years, certainly that was the case. And this business of how jurisdiction develops differently at sea as opposed to on land is as broad a truly novel development in historical analysis, a new attention to the geographical element. Now, it might seem obvious to the well-informed audience that there is a strong connection between geography and history. But paradoxically, us historians and geographers instead have never been easily collaborating particularly this, because the very strong tradition of Anglo-American scholarship of strengthening and pushing forward the importance of human agency created a situation in which historians that were too interested in the geographical element were accused of geographical determinism, because that is the capital sin. Let's underestimate the power of human agency. We can do better. but. In fact, geography does matter a lot. And the growing focus in contemporary politics on the peculiarities of maritime jurisdictions as evidence or not of an effective dominion has allowed geography to re-enter. The multilateral series of conflict over the South China Sea was briefly mentioned by Nick in his introduction. To this, I would add something which I think is having and will have in the coming years monumental repercussions, which is how the melting of the Arctic Ocean is opening new northern waterways and is making accessible resources that were not so before. Grotius and Selden were particularly interested, both of them, funnily enough, in how the issue of jurisdiction at sea within small and enclosed maritime spaces had been developed by the Republic of Venice over centuries. You see four different maps, four different centuries, and three, at least, different nations or cultures that produce these maps. And in all of them, you see how before the 18th century, the Adriatic Sea was called the Gulf of Venice, which is somewhat interesting if you think that Venice is just one tiny dot on the northwest side of such a large body of water. 
Many has actually won, if you will, its battle for jurisdiction on the sea. And it became a condemnation and it became impossible to enforce. So the issue of how to handle actually responsibility of jurisdiction at sea, even in contemporary policy oriented literature that discusses the complex situation in the Malacca Straits, frequently, if not always, has a footnote about take a look and how it was handled medieval Venice and early modern Venice. Unfortunately, there is not a lot of recent literature on this. So it's always the classic studies that are caused. Mentioning the melting oceans allows me to move on to an absolutely crucial new development, which is the understanding of the environmental history in the maritime sphere, but particularly in the amphibious sphere, that is to say, coastal history. Uh, a little of spread of books, mostly to show that the exploited seas is something, is a book, fantastic book, which was all published in the very early 90s, and it still hasn't lost any of its importance. And the second one is one that I would like to bring particularly to your attention. Because what is happening is that works such as that of the Jani Bhattacharya are showing us how the issue of actual management of resources and expansion of jurisdiction within the colonial sphere and with the action with local powers always had a very important environmental element. Things that emerge less from the archives of the metropolis and more from the archives of the colonies, as I mentioned earlier. In terms of the analysis of climate change, there's less work which is specifically maritime. However, what is absolutely crucial are projects such as this one, Old Weather. Old Weather is a long running project under the splendid leadership of Rob Allen, who's a climatologist, contemporary climatologist, not an historian, working at the Met Office who has established a fantastic dialogue between maritime and naval historians for sharing archival findings, particularly from commercial and military ship logbooks, and use this to provide fantastic big data sets that can be used for climate projections and modeling in contemporary climate analysis. This is a project that for years was in part support by governments. Now it's less supported by government, but it's also an example of a very successful way in which crowdsourcing is allowing the analysis of this data, because a lot of the trans transcriptions of these logbooks are actually done by volunteers. <clears throat> I've stressed a lot the economic element. And when I was thinking about what to say tonight, all of a sudden I realized that it's important to mention that for the pre-modern period, before the Industrial Revolution, the sea was the engine of economic European growth. So great attention has been given traditionally for the contribution of technological developments in this area. But recently, the, sh the focus has shifted to elements connected with the lowering of both transaction cost and production cost. So basically, we're talking about the cost of labor with all the social implications this have and the ways in which credit networks were supporting maritime expansion and trade. In this area, the work of Richard Anger, Shipping and Economic Growth, there is the first book, has been absolutely pathbreaking. And the stress on the economic element, which has been underlying, 
in a sense closes the circle with the attention to the legal element, which was also stressed by Nick in his own introduction. Because for the first time probably ever, economic historians and legal historians are cooperating now in trying to understand new ways of discovering and investigating the past. Because in practical terms, we still have a very fuzzy perception of how pre-modern economies functioned in actual practice, how contracts were enforced, which forum of litigation, particularly when the maritime element was involved, were the protagonists. Extreme new studies, as I mentioned earlier, point towards an essential interaction of the normative states in the plural centered activities and desires and individual networks of practitioners. We thought that only Europeans were active in this area across the globe. We now know that the role of other non-Europeans actors was absolutely essential, was absolutely essential also in shaping European activities. And this massive economic growth supported by principally maritime trade had as a side effect, a devastating impact on the welfare of seamen. You'll see up in the slide a quote, which is, was written in 2020, 2010 in the introduction of a volume discussing seafarers right. It's a frightening quote. Over the last few decades, the global economy and more specifically international shipping has gone through an almost technological, financial and structural change, which in light of the destructive market competition have brought about low freight rates, short time in port and turnaround times, production in full size, employment of cheap labor from developing countries, avoidance of national regulations and taxes and diminished living and working standards on board. I normally use this quote to discuss the situation of the exploited English crews in the 17th century Mediterranean, which lived in and worked in a situation equivalent to indentured servitude. But honestly, after what happened last month with the PO Ferris shenanigans about sacking all their employers in the UK, you can see that this type of situation has got a continuity, which is rather frightening. In the last few minutes, though, I would like to start with something that I'm sure you're all familiar with and end up on a slightly more positive note. It's just a bit more than one year that the maritime word was brought to a halt by the ever given block industries canal. <coughs> The massive cost which this accident generated brought new public interest into the legal instrument of general average. In fact, it is through this very ancient legal instrument that the cost of that accident are being absorbed as we speak. I have been running for the past five years a research project on the historical development of general average so from the very minute and selfish perspective of my project, finally, I don't have to explain everything about GA when I mention it. There are some elements behind averages, namely their mutual nature that are now being looked at with new eyes. I put up two definitions up there. One is rule A1 of the York Antwerp rules, which are produced by the Comité Maritime and then approved or adopted by various states, which define what a general average act. And then I put the first legal treaty on general average, which is by Quentin Whiteson, although general average was known in pre-modern times, and in fact, it's referenced both in the Act of the Apostles and in the Old. Now, the maritime world has got one characteristic, which I think is very sad and very relevant for contemporary policy concerns. It's always been, and it still remains, the riskiest of all 
working environments. The most dangerous type of activity for both individual and goods. The great protagonist in analyzing how risk management was done in maritime history has traditionally been insurance. And in fact, maritime insurance history is experiencing a veritable renaissance. This is a book published in the last five years, each of them absolutely fantastic. But over the last few decades, the growing interest in insurance across different subfields and national historiographies really owes a lot to the way in which economic historians have all adopted, or most of them adopted, what us called the new institutional economics approach. That is to say, focusing on how institutions can help to foster or not economic growth. One of the great things at the basis of the historical success of marine insurance is that it did not only cover risk, but it also became, since the very beginning in 14th century Genoa, a tool of capital rising and of speculation. General average remained instead a strictly mutualistic tool of risk management. And unlike insurance, did not become a speculative instrument. On these issues, I can show you the cover of the book, which is coming out in the summer. I approved the color last week. Why is general average possibly pointing to a more sustainable maritime economy in the future? Ethical principle behind GA then, as frankly now, is its ethical implication of acting as a break, a remedy, if you will, a legal remedy for unjustified enrichment. Now, if a sustainable economy is based on balancing economic development, environmental development, and social development, trying to find new and bigger uses, wider uses for legal instruments, of all traditions that have got at their basis principles of equity is possibly a way forward. In contemporary economic activities, this is happening. Equity-based instruments traditionally found or at least tracing their roots onto medieval Sharia law are becoming increasingly popular ways of sharing profits and losses in a way in which it's not based, biased towards shareholders and against stakeholders, but try to find a balance between these two elements are becoming increasingly more common, even in contemporary management in very recent years. Beyond the maritime sector and within the wider area of transport law, Given the ambitions recently expressed by COP26, of course, recent political developments have made us forget that we were supposed to hold on to very strict things. And active global discussions, sustainable new transport solution are drawing on general average. How to share the costs of transactions in a way in which it's not by lowering the salaries of stakeholders and by increasing the profits of shareholders are done. Even more crucially, if you will, for issues that have to do with how to counteract the effect of climate change, there's new voices in policy management, particularly active in France, that are trying to see the entirety of the planet as a community of risk as defined by general average in which a voluntary and intentional act to save us from a bigger danger needs to be redistributed equitably between all of those that made the sacrifice. There's a very interesting series of podcasts which is happening. This was a screenshot of a couple of weeks ago. I think there's one or two more that have been posted ever since, which exactly discuss how these new elements can be introduced in a way that is suitable 
for all parties. So maritime histories, particularly of the pre-modern variety, are indeed many and varied, and have definitely moved from the traditional support of national mythologies and self-representation onto trying to confront what planetary challenges we have, which go very well beyond the maritime sphere of itself. Thank you very much for your attention. Maria, uh, thank you so much. I mean, that was, um, you know, such a rich and panoramic survey of the historiography and its implications for what we um, face today and the challenges we face um, as a world. I mean, it was in incredible. Also, I think just listening to you, just just extraordinary, the advances in the, the, the different strands of historiography that you described um, just in the last 10 and 20 years. I mean, really quite remarkable uh, advances that are being made and intellectual boundaries that are being pushed forward and uh, archival um, discovery. I mean, just really phenomenal. So thank you very much indeed for that. I mean, there's all sorts of things I think it, it raises. And I think, you know, ending there with this question of general average and how it relates to uh, collective burden sharing and contribution for tackling climate change between nations, but also between social classes and between uh, uh, populations living in more or less exposed areas with histories of contribution to climate change um, uh, that have accumulated or, or not, as it, as, it, as it may be. I think, you know, that's incredibly interesting too. And for uh, uh, I think to connect those questions to the question of you know, as, as you as you mentioned, you know, the very graphic example of P&O um, sacking all of its seafarers and replacing them with uh, uh, labour that has no national rights and entitlements, minimum wage even, um, uh, is an extraordinary example of that, of cost dumping through uh, exploitation. And uh, you know, raises some really important questions, not least because p &O itself, of course, has its origins in British empire trade in the, what we would now call the Indo-Pacific. Um, so, you know, just enormously interesting. Thank you so much for that. Um, I want just to go to a, uh, a couple of questions. Well, Marie uh, uh, Drett, um, uh, th uh, thanking you very much. She asked a question early on, which um, you touched on in particular as you went into the discussion of networks and piracy, I think in particular, but was, you know, apart from the sovereign and sovereigns, um, what is the role uh, in contemporary histories of small people, she says, and small states? And I suppose there's sort of a couple of elements to that. I mean, one is obviously, as you described it, you know, this movement away from Westphalian state history towards understanding interconnections of state and non-state actors, networks, and um, uh, uh, the idea of, you know, the actualization of sovereignty. Um, and I suppose what, what, what would be the kind of contemporary equivalence of thinking like that? How would we think about that um, in respect of, uh, I mean, there's obviously still piracy and we still have, you know, particularly, oh, yeah. you know, in quite a big way, but there may be other ways in which we need to think about uh, those sort of non-state actors and their networks. And then, of course, with small states, we have, um, you know, very big questions, not least in terms of climate impacts, but, um, but also in terms of their relationship to the political projects of, you know, the he hegemonic powers um, and how they relate to those economic and otherwise. Um, but perhaps, perhaps you could say a little bit a, a bit about that, Maria. Yeah, with pleasure. It's a fantastic point. And thank you very much for, for the question. Small states, paradoxically, have advantages when it comes to maritime jurisdiction as opposed to land-based jurisdiction. Because the element of, you know, sheer land size or population numbers count substantially less. And it's always possible to carve mm. economic and political niches. Now, if I have to think historically, probably one of the best examples I can make is how throughout the, from the late 17th century, the Scandinavian countries mm. uh, managed to have a global projection, which was completely out of scale with their presence in Europe. Yeah. Uh, they could take advantage of technological developments, very, um, very well targeted uh, 
capital investments and playing between the big boys, if you will, you were mentioning the hegemonic states, uh, the Swedes managed to make fortunes uh, by being neutral in moments in which most other major European countries were engaged in active conflicts and the Danish did the same. And I think that you can see today in contemporary shipping that some minority small nations, as long as they have some sort of coastal projection, mm. have managed to take advantage of such facilities as well. Uh, if you think about even the issue about flag and flags of convenience, mm. uh, they're in themselves one way in which a state projects, not necessarily in a classical way, but manages to play particularly on the financial instruments, which today move faster and are a bit more sophisticated, but not a lot more than before. The real advantages that they happen in real time to actually benefit from niche situations mm. um, that avoid, if you will, or play against each other, the, the greater states with the true hegemonic ambitions. Mm. So it's from the commercial point of view. The real dramatic situation today is that of small coastal states which are underdeveloped yeah. and which are effectively paying the price of climate change and economic development of the West, in which case, yes, the West is a, a category of really, you know, the first word, what we would say in a slightly old fashioned terminology. And the reality is that this, they're left to themselves because they, are sim they simply do not have the um, capital, if you will, to invest in certain solutions. And they're at the mercy of the big players. The idea of introducing a mutual element of community of risk was exactly to spread this cost. If the, it's the entirety of the planet which is at risk, it shouldn't be only the victims that pay. Um, there will be serious issues that are due to coastal erosions and disappearance over the next 20 years in terms even of mass migration. Uh, if present government are concerned by a few tens of thousands today, it's gonna be substantially bigger uh, if we let the coast, the sea rise level, rise at the way they've been risen in the last 20, 30 years, yeah. even with all the promises that politically have been made. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can I ask you a couple of um, questions about the sort of um, state projects for conceptualizing maritime space? I mean, you mentioned, in, you know, the melting of the Arctic and what that will do to, you know, f firstly, opening up new routes for maritime travel and then kind of control over those and uh, who has interest in them and also resource extraction. Um, and I, I just wonder, is there anything we learn from history about how states seek to give conceptual dis as it were distinction to maritime spaces in order then to configure how they are used policed what trade takes place within them and so on and i'm thinking also here of this of the idea of the indo-pacific which i mean it has a geographical and environmental reality um uh, I mean, think, you know, reality in brackets, perhaps, but um, uh, is also obviously a strategic concept, which has been developed in particular in recent years by the US for understanding its approach to China, its alliances in uh, uh, the South, in Southeast Asia, Far East Asia and across the Pacific, and thinking about how, you know, it, it often comes with the tag, you know, uh, free um, and secure trade in the or free trade in the Indo-Pacific. So there you see a very close connection between a kind of, you know, a geopolitical objectives and a strategic mobilization of a certain way of thinking about maritime spaces. I, and I, you know, you mentioned the Gulf of, of, of Venice for the, you know, for the Adriatic. And I just wonder if there's anything you might say a little bit about, about that kind of, you know, those sort of geopolitical state projects which then configure and conceptualize in strategic ways certain maritime um, spaces? Ah, well, the cultural constructions, mm. as you were saying. Uh, the problem is enforcement of jurisdiction, yeah. which is why the moment in which uh, Lauren Benton came up with the expression of jurisdictional lanes all of a sudden made perfect sense. Now, yeah. 
for the pre-modern period, let's say for the pre-steam engine, when you were at the mercy of the wind, these lanes were very precise. So mm. an ocean might have been massive, but you were relatively very limited in the options you had to navigate because you were depending on, nation, on natural phenomenon that had to support the wind. Uh, this, of course, with engines and steam, beyond steam, it, we thought we had solved that problem, if you will, because you go where you want as fast as you want, yeah. as fast as your engine would break you. Because the problem becomes, one can claim jurisdiction over a certain area. How do you enforce it? How do you enforce it in legal terms? And there's still massive discussions daily about particularly situations like you were rightly mentioning, the Malacca Straits, mm. in which you can't apply the normal rules of 10, 20 miles and stuff like that because the borders are far too close. Yeah. But even when you get a legal recognition of your jurisdictional right, how do you enforce it? And this would be very interesting. I mean, there have been fish wars in the North Sea since the Middle Ages. Mm. And the fact that there are bigger wars at present is slightly putting this down. And, you know, the fact that we are coming out of monumental pandemics. But if you think about the level of friction that there was in the North Sea in 2019 pre-pandemic, it really sounded like the early 17th century, to be honest, for an historian. It was rather funny, if you will if it hadn't been tragic for its real implications. Yeah. But one of the issues that play a lot when the sea is in, particularly for some countries that have a traditional idea about their own nature being intrinsically connected to sea, is how much self-representation becomes important compared to an effective cost-benefit analysis from the economic point of view, or even from the social point of view. That is to say, certain political decisions have been made historically, are being made politically, because there was a certain self-perception of how a country perceives itself, mm. uh, which then turns out to be not actually real, because another interesting element is that countries that think of themselves as strongly maritime oriented, with their heart, if you will, when it comes to strong decision about policy, uh, become very sea blind. <laughs> so, yeah. sea blindness being a category that us historians use a lot for discussing certain elements in traditional maritime countries. Yeah, yeah. Well, I suppose we've had that. Uh, I suppose the war in Ukraine, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, has sort of raised again those questions of, you know, the Indo Pacific was associated in the kind of American Asian pivot, associated with a kind of resurgence of maritime thinking about security uh, and that, you know, we were past the age of sort of mass land armies in Europe in the Cold War and we were now in the, you know, into a different way of thinking about security and... Or so we thought. <laughs> yeah, so we thought. And of course, for the, for the British, uh, it doesn't take much to, to re-excite their view of, them, you know, political discourses about Britain being a, a seafaring maritime nation, uh, you know, as J.R. Seeley put it, you know, with, with uh, you know, like Venice with the sea for its streets. Um, and, um, and perhaps the Ukraine war has kind of given a bit of a shock to that way of thinking strategically. Um, but it also does kind of bring up that question, doesn't it, of how uh, states see themselves. Are they, do they see, do they see uh, security as being predominantly maritime, the Alfred Mann position or the Mackinder position, is it about uh, land mass and about where you are in, on the land? And um, I suppose one, one uh, you know, question for, for, for this is the sort of, um, and maybe a bit beyond the scope of today's discussion, but it is a, li a little bit about how those ways of thinking about your uh, strategic position relate to as you said, you know, you get this sea blindness, but you also get a kind of maritime self-definition, and then a, which tends to kind of be in conflict with a land-based definition, and we see that re recurring in geopolitical discussion. Mm, wow. <laughs> well, let me start with, with the Black Sea. The Black Sea is a fantastic example of this, mm. and the conflict itself is a very interesting example. Uh, the fact that Crimea was conquered 
was exactly to achieve a southern facing maritime outlay for Russia. Yeah. And the fact that now the whole reorganization of the strategy of the military attack or special operation, we should call it, has been to connect the Donbass with Crimea. Yeah. Hence, the sack of Mariupol is, is incredibly medieval, if you will, in its yeah. own conception. Yeah. But the reality is that the Black Sea has been a gateway between Asia and Europe since Roman times. And yeah. I say Roman only because we don't really have a lot of evidence for pre-Roman times. Yeah. Uh, when the, one of the biggest economic problems for Europe of the Ottoman conquest of the Byzantine Empire was the closure of the Black Sea. And unless you had specific capitulations with the Ottoman port, you would not have rights of navigation yeah. because it's substantially faster to cross from Central Eurasia and get into the Mediterranean by the Black Sea. The opening uh, after the Ottoman loss at Kuchu Kanyardi in 1774, and the Black Sea was open again to European traffic, was one of the major structural changes of late 18th, 19th century maritime trade on the global scale. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, in the one century afterwards, the Brits ended up involved in a war in the Crimea as well, Florence Nightingale, anyone. So it's interesting how continuity there is about yeah. the fact that it's faster on sea. You don't need the expansion of land. You can move more nimbly. So even in a small actor, you can actually, you know, play above your size. Yes. And at the same time, controlling it is incredibly difficult. And mm -hmm. climate change is substantially changing that because the increase of risk caused by extreme or unpredictable or the volatility of climate events at sea is having serious effect even on contemporary transaction cost of maritime trade. It's far less predictable than it was even 20 years ago. So even from the point of view of our, you know, last minute economy in which everything needs to be delivered at the last second, you know, the ever given in a sense was, was a fantastic example, but you know, this happens constantly because in the maritime lanes where the forecast is not as predictable, as reliable as it could be because of these extreme weather events connected to climate change. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not sure if that's an answer. No, no, it's brilliant. It's completely brilliant. And, the, and of course there's the, there's also the issue of the uh, of climate emissions of uh, uh, seafared cargo and you know ca ca can you build electric ferries can you possibly you know you can get massive container ferries we have them now that would claim to be per unit much more climate efficient but nonetheless are still um, uh, you know huge contributors because they're you know they're they're burning fossil fuels for transport um, you know it's another dimension as you say to the question then of cost it's not about predictability but about cost. Um, no, that, 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 that's incredibly interesting. I just want to, I'm looking, I, I can't see any, any other questions in, in the, in the, in the Q&A. I mean, I, I could go on all, all night with this, Maria, it's fa absolutely fascinating. Um, but I can't see any, um, I can't see any, any questions in, in, in the Q&A. But I, 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 I do wonder whether, um, uh, I mean, I think you did an incredible job of, of, of relating, you know, as I said, at the, in my, uh, first response, uh, uh, you know, these incredible developments in uh, the historiography um, in different aspects of it to contemporary policy challenges. And, and I just uh, and I, I just wonder whether um, I, I mean, just a final reflection, perhaps on, on whether, you know, whether and how much more of that can be done. Um, um, uh, because, as, as you say, I mean, we, you know, we, we've long had connections between historians and policymakers, and we've long had connections between particular historians with particular interests. And as you in, intimated at the beginning, how then politicians frame how they think about the world and talk about it. Um, uh, you know, you mentioned the idea of the Anglosphere. I mean, I, I wrote some, a book on this with a colleague at Cambridge a few years ago. And... You can see that the idea of an Anglosphere, which is mobilised in the context of Brexit debates to give Britain a kind of alternative to Europe as its place in the world, is in part done by historians who are sympathetic to the British Empire and sympathetic to the Brexit project. 
um, they contribute to that. Historians for Britain, I do remember. Yes, and um, and people that had spent, um, you know, the 1990s and the 2000s sort of re trying to, to, to rethink some of the British Empire um, history um, in order to, uh, you know, to, as I say, partly at least to bring that into relationship to a kind of contemporary political project around Brexit. And so I just, I, I wonder whether, you know, speaking uh, um, as, an, as, an, as an historian, um, you know, and as you said, with, with, with colleagues who are doing this work, you know, what more can be done, not to ask you to mobilise your work in the service of a political project, but to sort of connect it to some of these understandings better than perhaps is the case at the moment uh, of contemporary political debate and political discourse. I think that, and, and this goes well beyond the Anglosphere, if you will, mm. uh, there needs to be some proper understanding uh, on part of, let's say, the West, because it's an easier label, mm. that economic growth cannot continue ad infinitum, and that a more equitable distribution of the results of economic growth is necessary to confront the challenges that are coming from our own planet. Mm. That I think is, is for me, the crucial element. Yeah. What is becoming very, very difficult is that there is an incredible background noise of uninformed comments from the heart that do not really take into account nor the historical experience, nor frankly, the political realities in which compromise is seen as betrayal, in which agreement is seen as reneging one's nationality or one's identity. Mm. And, and in a sense, the problem is that everyone's identity is crucial. So one needs to appreciate that there needs to be a form of compromise in that. Mm. And it's easier for politicians to whip up uh, mythologies most of the time. I mentioned this word a couple of times. Maritime history for a long time was a purveyor of mythologies, you know, these dashing heroes. But I can tell you that Sir Francis Drake, for all his dashing jewelry and presence of tobacco to the queen, is seen as a brigand by most of the rest of the planet, uh, you know, and the, even the reality of, of an island nation, if you will, mm. is mostly a result of 19th century propaganda in actual practice from the point of view of the legal framework of maritime labor. It was blueprinted on feudal relationship. Britain was a profoundly feudal country when it started to sail the waves. And so even the contractual agreement that English seamen had were far more similar of those of their apprentice on land than it happened in other countries. So this intermingling of, of historical analysis and mythological self-representation, which politicians from both side of the political divide or from the polyfunctional side mm. of the political divide pursue is dangerous but it also feeds onto long-stranded narratives yeah yeah of course yeah absolutely okay well maria thank you very much indeed um i think that was just wonderful we're, we're coming up to um quarter past seven but um uh, i just thought that was a, a fabulous lecture and just what we wanted to, um in this series so thank you so much indeed for your time and for that presentation. thank you for the invite it's yeah. been well, a wonderful opportunity and forced me to reread and rethink lots of things so i'm very grateful for this thank well, well thank you and we will um as i mentioned at the beginning we will um make a video and podcast available to people so that um uh you can watch it again or if you have friends and colleagues who didn't uh, see it uh, this evening that they can watch it again too. I certainly will go, be going back for some of the references because I'm uh, very interested in these questions. So thank you very much indeed, Maria. It was wonderful. And um, thank you. Thanks everybody at home for joining us this evening. It was really great to have you with us. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you. Bye bye.